Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Olson, so I teach uh, IT 303 Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt class in the business school. We also have uh, Kathy Chen's class. Kathy Chen's class is? <coughs> Materials Engineering Lab 2. Materials Engineering Lab 2. There you go. Welcome to you guys. And let's see, so from the Central Coast Lean group here, Rupesh, you just want to say who you are and what you do? Yeah, uh, Rupesh Arbai, I represent uh, Zodiac Aerospace, uh, uh, Program Director for uh, Programs in Santa Maria. So we do cabin interiors, uh, we do design all the way through fabrication uh, right here on the Central Coast. Okay, uh, good. We're huge lean proponents. So, uh, and you're a huge lean guy, right? I'm sorry? You're a huge lean guy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Improved <laughs> uh, throughput and profitability. Okay. And I saw a couple of my Cal Poly buddies snuck in. You guys want to introduce yourselves? You can stand up, Margie. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, Chris. Welcome. Okay, so um, this is a this is sort of an interesting opportunity for us. Uh, our guest speaker comes here every quarter to talk to Kathy's class and my class. Um, Recently, we started combining it also and said, hey, why don't we just invite everybody from the Central Lean community um, to come in and see this also. We're also live streaming this to portions of my class. We're going to record this and post this afterwards. So if you didn't you know, hear it all or, or get all the information you want, you can also go back and watch it um, afterwards once again. Let's see. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get, uh, go ahead and kick off. We've got um, Bill Bellows from Aerojet, Rocketdyne Aerojet, here to speak to you. Um, Bill and I first started doing this sort of thing, boy, it must be now five or seven years, you know, that, that uh, Bill's sort of been coming up here and talking to the class. You know, Bill, you know, he'll be first to tell you he is not necessarily a lean guy, but he is a thinking guy. And, you know, the, the way he talks about some of the same issues and problems that we look at from a Lean Six Sigma perspective, um, I think is really valuable and it's something I, I want to, you guys to hear that. I want to bring it into the classroom and also bring it into the Lean community. Um, because of the way we're set up, I think Bill is, uh, we're going to run this in sort of two sessions. Bill's going to try to speed through and kind of get a first session done by three o'clock. I'm going to do a little quick break and then we're going to transition to maybe another set of students are going to come in and we'll do sort of a, a second half sort of deal. So people have to leave, we'll be able to go and we'll be able to continue on. So that's the way it's all going to map out. And without adding any less value from me talking, Bill Bellows. Go. All right, thanks. All right, thanks for coming out. Kathy and Eric, the slides later. Yeah, so uh, you can paste through them at your leisure. And there's an article. I'll send you a link to a site. You can find all your articles. So um, Eric mentioned on the my lead reference. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by background. I have a PhD in mechanical engineering and thermal sciences. And uh, but I got excited by ideas I never heard about in college. Uh, there's only so much stuff you can cover in college. But I'm sharing with you ideas that I don't think you'll find anywhere, um, at least consolidated. And if you'd like to find out, if you ever like to find out more, uh, you can contact me at that email address. You, you can call me, come visit. There's a seminar uh, for once a month that gets into these ideas in great detail. I've been offering it for uh, 23 years now. I've offered it extensively across the United Kingdom. Uh, and so the, the ideas of sharing are, I think, have everything to do with how everything works. It's not just engineering. Uh, and so there's a lot of thought involved that I don't think we pay that much attention to. And that's what I want to you know, get into here is that we make, we make assumptions relative to how we run organizations 
the NRSA don't stand up to close or rigorous scrutiny. That's what I want to share with you. So the, the title, Come Together, comes from a Beatles song. They're trying to, they think it's the Let It Be album, which a few of us have done. And it, as I read the article back over the holidays, uh, I think the Beatles just agreed to have their music streamed. And within a few weeks or so, the Come Together song was their, the number one downloaded song or played song. And I'd always been fascinated with that term, so that led to, let's put it together in an article. And then you'll see where the mind of choice comes in. So, uh, so before coming to Rock and Dine, where I've been for 25 years, uh, where we make rock engines, I worked in aerospace in Connecticut, where we made tank engines. So most of my industrial experience has to do with uh, moving things. And then, uh, Audiences I presented to, this is a light bulb factory in Glasgow, Scotland. And this is a city council of York, England. Let's see, library staff at Cal Poly. 2005, six, nine, nine. And this is an after school program where somebody said, I can't show those faces. I said, <laughs> <laughs> and it was neither about the after school program. We met for an hour and a half a week for four weeks. And I did that after teaching at Northwestern's business school for four years as an adjunct professor. And uh, these students were a lot more fun. But one of them, at the end of the, like in the opening, one of them raises her hand. These are fifth and sixth graders. And she says, uh, Mr. Bellows, will there be a grade you know, for the after school program? And I said, no, there won't be a grade. And she crossed her arms with this big grade and says, good. Which begs the question, you know, why is that your response? She says, now we can have fun. It's pretty sad. <laughs> so uh, in addition to uh, Model T's, so Henry Ford said, uh, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. He also suggested coming together is beginning, keeping, keeping together is progress, working together is success. Notice that together word shows up. And then Vincent Van Gogh, uh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. So fast forward to 2016, when choosing to transform any enterprise from working separately to working together. And that's the big, the choice thing I want to pay attention to is the difference between together and separate. Right? And working together offers, I'd say, undeniable economic benefits. It's not just an expression. I mean, economically, teamwork is the ability of two of us to do the work of 10 people. That's working together. Working independently, two of us are as productive as two people. And if we work against each other, then 10 of us are as productive as two. So it could get better, it can get worse. But if you work independently, then two people are as productive as two people. So synergy is that two of us could be as productive as five or six. And I say finally an organization where productivity is not, in, where people are not interested in what teamwork means. And yet what organizations are designed around is working independently. So working together is just an expression, sadly. And so uh, towards this end, would anyone name their football club Manchester Divided and operate it accordingly? All right, uh, in this visit, I'm going to share insights and differences between independence and interdependence, between Manchester Divided and Manchester United, between working separately and together. Right. And then jump down to the bottom. Which solution best fits a given situation, together or separate? That's where the choice comes in. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is language, and then management, perception, and thinking. And I'll show you how these ideas. How Ford discovered these ideas relative to the design of an automatic transmission. And what Ford did, we've done at Rocket Dine a number of occasions. And then counting, what is counting about taking tests? That's a, an example for you. And then opportunities to act, opportunities to think. And then uh, interrupt at any point. Okay, so what does it mean to work together, learn together, and think together? And I, uh, I took this photo years ago. I just got a digital camera at work, and I went out. And my ambition was to spend an afternoon taking photos of teamwork. 
So I propose that these, the, the space in between these birds is not random. These birds are not flying separately. There's paradynamically, there's a pattern there. So what does together mean? Taken or considered collectively or co conjointly and without interruption, continuously, uninterruptedly. That's together. Uh, what can we do together? Eat together, join together, drive together, sit, live, pull, stand, grow. Right? I'm not saying that's the entire list, but this word shows up again and again. Synonyms, jointly, mutually, collectively, concurrently, simultaneously. Antonyms, separate, apart, individually, alone, and independent. That's the contrast piece. A lion, uh, this is Aesop's fable relative to the four oxen and the lion. A lion used to prowl about a field in which four oxen used to dwell. And the oxen had their tails together. And they lived a long while until they decided to go separate. That's what was the end of the oxen. That led to this divided, united we stand divided, we get eaten. Uh, that's the Henry Ford quote that I used earlier. We can skip that. And uh, Van Gogh quote. Where's the United Show up? Airlines, United Technologies, United States, United Kingdom, United Nations, Manchester, United, United Way. Shows up quite a bit. Now we get into management. Um, and I want you to imagine, um, yeah, I can't send you the video, but there's a, a half hour dialogue between Marseille Bob, who visited us quite a few times at the Nogan Park, he died a few years ago, and, and Dr. Denner, who died 20 years ago. So the two of them were talking, and Agos, who taught at the, the Wharton School of Management back at the University of Pennsylvania, he says, the characteristic way of management is that we have taught in the Western world to take a complex system, a rocket engine, the university, divide it into parts called School of Engineering, School of Architecture, those are parts. Right? And then with engineering, we have parts and mechanical, so those are all parts. Divide them into parts and then try to manage each part as well as possible. And if that's done, the system as a whole will behave well, and that's absolutely false. But that's what we do. What's missing is that the parts wouldn't fit. To which Dr. Deming said, they would not work together. To which Russ said, good. So it's the working together that's the main contribution to systemic thinking as opposed to working in parts separately. To which Deming said, yes, so easy it is to observe, to see, to understand, and yet people do not know about it. So my proposal is teamwork happens in sports, but it doesn't happen in it doesn't happen in universities. And well in sports it happens in universities. But in organizations, they're not designed for it. That daughter's artwork up at that Brown's day. So I remember we took her to the LA Zoo years ago. And uh, in the reptile house the LA Zoo, there's a two headed rattlesnake. Anybody ever seen a two rattlesnake? And on the aquarium, well, yeah, the, in the aquarium there's a little three by five card that says, in the wild, two-headed rattlesnakes have a very short life expectancy. And I thought two heads were better than one. See, if those two heads work together, the snake would live longer. So this is an example of one plus one is less than two. Uh, on baseball and sports, as I mentioned. You want to see a great example of teamwork, look at sports. All right. So you see I just added the word united. What makes those players united? How do, I, how do you know it's united? How do I know it's united? Um, they're all working together for like the, a common goal. They're trying to like achieve. But how does that manifest itself when you watch the game? What does it look like? It's them passing a ball around or 
cheering each other on, I guess. So. No, it's more than that. They have designated roles and positions to carry out a common goal. They what? Designated roles and like physical positions on the field. Uh, and I think I say they, the big thing is <clears throat> if there's a bunt play and the third baseman comes in to cover the bunt, is it possible the shortstop will cover third base? So as one player moves to the others move accordingly, then they are interdependent. Right? You see that in soccer all the time. The one player's position depends upon the other players. I move, they move. This is how organizations work. Each person is given a box, and that's their job. In such a model, the shortstop could not cover third base. They say, love to help you, but I'm in operations. What happens is the job descriptions become limited. The budget becomes limited. When your boss says, your job is not to help them, your boss, your job is to help my department. That makes sense? How much time is spent? This guy's going to ask a room full of uh, executives where I'm by Boeing. So how much time, and not just Boeing, wherever I go and ask the question, it's the same answer. So it's not just, it's not just Boeing. But it's a relevant question. You know, the question is, how do we spend our time? How much time is spent discussing parts, tasks, milestones, which are good and completed on time? And what do you think the answer is? Again and again. Guesses. Standard answer is zero. But they make it relevant. How much time do you spend studying for the final exam using quiz, questions from the weekly quizzes in the midterm, which were correct. Do you study questions you got right for the final exam? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do you appreciate it? Is it a priority to study the questions that are right or the questions that are wrong? The questions are wrong. So what's the logic behind focusing on what's wrong and not what's right? That's the logic. And that's the logic of, of knowing as opposed to the logic of learning. The logic of knowing is I know, the logic of learning is, but I could know more. And, and granted, every one of us in every organization has finite resources. So the question is, how do we spend our time? As homeowners, you know, fixing the hot water tank, replacing this, replacing this. The question is, when things aren't broken, what do you do? In an organization, we're waiting for the next thing to break, and we focus on the things that are broken. And that's why I want to you know, share with you, because it also has to do with another choice. If you work on things that are broken, my proposal is that you're waiting for things to break. Yeah, you'll go to work in corporations, and you'll spend a lot of time chasing, you'll go to meetings discussing things that are broken. Now, if you're working on a new program in development where things aren't defined yet, and we're you know, developing hypersonic cruise missiles, we're tweaking things, well, then good has not been defined. We're just tweaking, we're working on development. But once we go into production, and that product has all those parts, then we don't spend very much time working on parts that are good. And I want to share with you where that comes from and what it won't lead to. Okay, let's look at perception of things. So a product or service is conceived. Say <clears throat> any product. I just hear it, you know, cordless screw gun, which is convenient. So a product is conceived with uses in mind, but it's managed by <coughs> breaking it into parts. And then people are assigned to the parts. Looking at are we going to make the part, are we going to buy the part, are we going to use that in manufacturing? But we're looking at everyone has a part or multiple parts that chase, in which case that part or those parts become your primary focus. So all of your actions are on the parts taken out, taken separately. 
How does it work? It works based on how they work together. It's managed based on the parts taken separately. Another eight-block quote, a system is not the sum of its parts, it's the product of the interactions, which is the product of the relationships. The art of managing relationships, interactions, is very different than the art of managing actions, and history requires this transition. Every product, every university operates based on interactions, but it's managed based on actions. That's managing actions, that's managing interactions. I asked this question of a very senior guy at NASA headquarters once. Um, I said, what well, letter grade is required for all the parts and services purchased you know, in aerospace? It's not just aerospace, anywhere. What's the letter grade requirement on every handoff within an organization? So I hand off to Kathy, Kathy hands off to you. Because there are requirements that we're each given. So your job is to receive something, hand it off to the next person. So the question here is, what letter grade is required on every handoff? Most people think, you know, it's A plus, you know, well, we, we make rocket engines at A plus. Not A plus, it's passing. So what is passing? What is not failing? So what does that mean? It means our focus is, was it in the strike zone? And our strategy is, it doesn't matter where the strike zone is, what matters is that it's in the strike zone. Do you know any pitcher who pitches that way? Just getting anywhere in the strike zone doesn't matter where. But that's the logic behind managing parts, is as long as the part is good, and what does good mean? Good means requirements are met. What does bad mean means requirements are not met. So all these parts, and what I refer to as a macro big picture model, have to be good. Or, we look at each one of them and say, is it good or is it bad? Yeah, because we want the good. That's managing actions. If we're looking at the flow of work in an organization, we, we work on a, our given task. It could be a software module. We complete all these tasks, and then what happens to them? We, pass them on to the next person, they integrate them. Then it passes on to the next person, they integrate it. What's missing? There's no focus on the interactions, it's a focus on actions. What's missing is if you look on a scale of 60 to 100 being passing, the macro system model does not differentiate a 60 and 100. It treats all of those as the same. Because the question we're asking is, is the part good or is it bad? 60 is good, 70 is good, 80 is good. Our thinking is, everything which is good is identical. That's the logic. What's missing is, the variation which is inevitable is not part of the model, but it shows up in real life. But it only shows up when you put things together. As long as they remain separate, you never notice the effect. Okay. What do they call the person that graduates last in his or her class in medical school? Doctor. That's the logic of interchangeable parts. All doctors are the same. Go give me another one. What do you call the person that graduates last in his or her class at West Point? As a, the technical name is goat, as of the, as of the animal. And the difference is, at West Point, they're all second lieutenants, but when you begin to look at things as being different, then you're realizing that variation exists. And in terms of how organizations operate, we manage as if they're the same, but in reality, they are different. And the difference only shows up in use. This is where the transmission example comes in. So, an inspiration, this is one here. I don't believe there are many in the literature. But um, Ford, back in the early 80s, had an amazing discovery 
They let the warranty claim between the transmission they designed and Mazda built, because Ford owned part of Mazda. The same transmission was built by Ford. And if you look at things the way that Western management works, we say it doesn't really matter where they're made as long as I mean, whatever the, you know, the cheapest supplier is, just go with it. Here's what Ford learned. Much to their surprise, the number of complaints associated with the erratic shifting of the transmissions produced by the Ford plant were three times more than the complaints produced by the Mazda transmission. In fact, there are three differences. The transmission would look something like this, and the big thing is, uh, I'm going to show the follow-up explanation is, we have valves with springs that go into a bore. So people are responsible for the valve or the spring or the bore, but who's responsible for the function of the transmission? On close examination, what Ford does, Ford took 10 transmissions at random from both factories, at random, not consecutive, at random, and found that their focus was on the valve diameter and the bore diameter taken separately. Managing parts, Western management. That's managing actions. Meanwhile, Ford learned that Mazda's focus was to actively manage the gap between them. Whose job is that within Ford? Nobody's. <laughs> the valve's good. The hole's good. Who's got the gap? Nobody owns the gap. So what Mazda did was focus on the gap, and then with a gap defined, the two of us know how to achieve the gap. That's managing interactions. In doing so, Mazda realized there's an ideal gap just like there's an ideal spot in the strike zone. It's not anywhere. They have an ideal location, an ideal speed, and they and the teamwork is, Kathy and I both know what that means. So I don't move until she moves, she doesn't move until I move. That's managing interactions. Yes. Wouldn't Ford have indirectly defined the gap by defining the board diameter and then the valve diameter? Isn't that kind of indirectly defined? Not because they're defined with requirements, but we'll get to that. Yeah, this, um, not in terms of how things are defined. I'll, I'll show you that though. That's managing interactions. Classic Western manufacturing is everybody gets a set of requirements. And this is what Ford was doing. When Ford went off and measured 10 transmissions at random in both factories, they found out that four diameters within four, four were as small as possible. Why? They were just meeting the requirements. Yeah. If the turn page must turn paper must be between 20 and 25 pages, how long will it be? If Professor Nico, mechanical engineering, he told me this, he says, if he tells his students, come in by next class with at least 20 ideas, guess what? 20. And if valve diameters are made on the high side, because when you're machining an outer diameter, it's easy to go large and go small. Then our son, a few years ago, we went bowling as a family, and afterwards we walked down the hallway, and here's my wife's bowling ball. I said, why is it there? He said, mom said, put it in the bedroom. <laughs> Managing actions. So to your point, there isn't, there isn't an action that I can't define that you can't meet minimally. And what managing action says, as long as you make the action, then we're okay. And what the transmission story is showing is there's degree of action. So I <clears throat> got this photo from a friend over the weekend. He told his son to put his gloves away. Not quite. But that was cute. All right. This is what's going on. So what's the pattern you see in those four examples? You see variation. What else do you see? Each person has the right to do the minimum. Western management does not acknowledge that. Western management said, 
did you complete the task? And your answer is yes. How well did you complete the task is not asked. See the difference? We're managing actions. The macro system model, if you go macro, we're looking at the parts. The macro system model says meeting requirements is meeting requirements. All doctors are the same. All lawyers are the same. All chairs are the same. All mechanical engineers are the same. They're all the same. There's a situation where that might make a, make a reasonable assumption. Now, I don't know how many parking spots are on this campus for visitors, <laughs> but there's not enough. <laughs> and I don't care that there's variation, there's not enough. The microsystem model, micro under a microscope, the microsystem model says all well, parking spots have different widths, they have different shade patterns. If you ever notice yourself, driving around a parking spot, looking for the closest one to the you know, closest spot to the door, that's the microsystem model where you're saying, they're not all the same, they're actually different. So what Ford was doing is on the left, what Moss is doing is on the right. See the difference? I can't tell you how many times I've presented this and people say, well, Moss has changed requirements. Mazda's working to the same set of requirements as Ford. And so they change the requirements. It's the same set of requirements. This is what we do at home. So if you're cutting a piece of wood at home to a given length and you aim for the one line and not anywhere in between, then you're using the Mazda model. So why is it at home you use the Mazda model and focus on getting the wood cut to that line and not draw two lines and say anywhere in between is okay. Why at home do you focus on being close to that line and not anywhere in between? Because who does assembly? Yeah. It's like I just somebody at work, I said, now why at home do you aim for the one line and it work anywhere in between? He says, well, at home I cut wood and at work I cut metal. No. <laughs> No. Who designs it at work? That guy. Who does assembly work? That guy. So the idea is when you, my proposal is at home we are naturally managing interactions. And at work we naturally manage actions. And we haven't figured out that it's different. So the left hand side is mind the part, the right hand side is mind the gap. Now let's look at counting. One plus one equals what? Could be two. What's an example? An apple or an apple is two apples. Cup of water, cup of water is two cups of water. But in an organization, if I ask these seven departments each save a thousand dollars, do those savings add? Apples add, cups of water add, do savings add in this scenario? Does your organization save $7,000? Absolutely not. And the reason is these activities are interdependent. So the first person up here could be buying a photocopier which is $1,000 cheaper, but it breaks down more often, doesn't do two-sided copying. The organization will not save $1,000. Now, if it's not used, they'll save $1,000. But if anyone attempts to use it, it'll, it'll backfire. So this shows when people cut corners, thinking the work is independent, you end up with a, with a not only do you not save the $7,000, you're likely, you're likely to lose more than $7,000. And, and this, you know, part of it is you didn't put the stitch in time, so you lost nine. Now, if you understand interactions, then you do something like this. This is essentially what Moss was doing. Moss was saying, let's spend a thousand dollars mining, you know, the bore diameter, fifteen hundred dollars mining the valve diameter, and that will save us ten thousand dollars in warranty claims. That's 
This is what ACLA is talking about. This is a lot more work. Because here, you have to have a willingness to look beyond your department and spend your budget for the greater good of the organization. You might not get promoted doing that. You think because you understand one, you understand two, because one and one makes two, but you have to understand and, which is what's the nature of the relationship, right? So two of us working independently, one plus one is two. Two of us working against each other, that's one plus one is negative one, negative two. Two of us working together, that's two, three, four. Taking test. How'd you do on the test? You been asked that question before? Is that a question about independence or interdependence? Independence? It's also asking how did you do? So if I'm a professor and I ask you that question, I am immediately separated from you. So here's how it works. So I was interviewed by a coworker, sister, and I asked her to draw this. Here we went through the question, she wrote it down, and I said, what are the inputs to your grade? And she said uh, her ability, her commitment, and her energy, something like that. I said, what else? And she couldn't think of anything else. I said, well, have you ever had a situation in a classroom where another student asked a question, and you learn from it? She said, it happens all the time. I said, oh, then that means other students are inputs. She said, yes. So I said, given that input, what other inputs are there? And she said, her professor, her parents, her brother. I said, how many inputs are there? She said, there are an infinite number of inputs. I said, how come you couldn't see them before? She said, I was focusing on me. Well, if all those other inputs are real, then is the question, how did you do on the test? Or is the question, how did we do on the exam? Question is, can you accomplish anything by yourself? That's what teamwork means. I had a guy in West Palm Beach, you know, where Pratt Whitney he says, Oh, I solved this problem all by myself. I said, Where'd the training come from? Oh. <laughs> Who built the roads? Oh. All right. Who provided the electricity? Oh. How did we do if you want to design? How did we do? How did we do? How did we do is based on interdependence. What we see depends upon what we thought before we looked. And the role of these questions and these contrasts that get you to start to listen more closely to the difference between how did you do and how did we do? Opportunities act. Choose separate and choose together, but choose it meaningfully. There's a place for both. I mean, right? People who are married get divorced because they realize that separate is better than, than together. There's a place for that. Um, choose independence versus interdependence. But, but choose it from an understanding of what interdependence means. It's not just a change of word. I understand the difference between a macro system model and a micro system model. So, if you're Eric and you're the president of General Motors and you want to know how many cars we shipped last week, that's a macro system question because he's pretending every car is different. But unless in the workforce he has students that understand how to manage gaps, then he's going to spend a lot of time in, 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 in meetings with customers complaining. But there's nothing wrong with a macro system model, it's not a micro system model, it's two different models. You can mind, mind the bad, which is focusing on bad, or mind the good. And what Ford is doing is minding the, minding the bad. You know, focus on the bad to make them good, leave the good alone. We have results from Rocket now. We're saving a fortune. And, and I've demonstrated not only assembly savings, but significant performance improvements of our rocket engines by minding gaps and not parts. But what's amazing is when you show those results to people, what they think we did was mind parts. Which is why we talk about finding parts and finding gaps. 
mining actions or interactions. So it's a contrast. Again, I'm not saying one is better than the other. It's two different approaches. There's a place for both. Um, addition or super addition. Opportunities to think. This is a roadmap of seminars, conference calls, and activities we started 20 some years ago. Not, not all of them are still active. Um, we invite members of band, individual contributors, students. We've had hospital employees. We've had over a thousand people from the community attend since we opened our doors in 1998. Um, those are distance learning opportunities. The one in the center, the in thinking together, is what has been offered for uh, 23 years now. And if you'd like to be on the mailing list to find out about these activities, um, there's a newsletter that goes out <coughs> twice a month. And there's a, a minute or so left for questions. Yes, how did you come up with this? Because by observation, just through observation or? Just a question. I got exposed to a Taguchi, T-H-E-U-C-H-I, in 1987. And his definition of quality is amazing. His definition of quality is uh, not about parts, it's about relationships. He defines quality as minimizing loss to society. So he's saying is, my work is judged by how easy you assemble. Holy cow. And then found out that uh, he did a lot of work with uh, Toyota in the 50s. And, it's, uh, and so I look at, see the Lean community looks at Toyota and says, oh, it's, we, we see what we see. This is where the virus, I mean, what we see depends upon what we thought before we looked. And so I write these articles to give presentations because what I see is, that, I mean, I may see the same thing others see, but my explanations are not good parts. My explanations come from these accounts and then piecing this together. And I realized, why at home do I aim for the line? Why at work is it anywhere in between? You know, why at work does, do people not come to me and ask me for help for things that are good? Why is that the case? Why am I constantly called into crises? It's like, holy cow, this is it. And then it's been, it's been a great deal of time with, uh, an enormous amount of time with Dr. Fugushi and Russ Aikoff. The more I looked at their work, I thought, holy cow, we're missing something. But you won't, you can go your entire life and never get exposed to this. And so I get excited to come up here and present it to you. Um, the last time I was here, you're from Zion? Yeah. So the last time there's some coworkers, your coworkers, they said, well, everything we're doing is Western. I said, well, <laughs> and it was a really good question. It was like, what do we do? I said, well, realize that it's Western. <laughs> It, it is what it is. Everyone else is doing Western. Does that make it right? Does it make it wrong? Do what you want. But I'm also inspired by teamwork. And so then I started thinking, well, well, wait a minute. Teamwork, how can your part as good be teamwork? <laughs> it's not teamwork. That's you telling me you're done. And I've got coworkers who come in and they'll say, well, Recently investigating an engine anomaly. And this is a, a woman I just met a few years ago. And, um, and I was explaining some of the stuff to her. And she said, Well, wait a minute. I was asked to investigate an anomaly. We had an engine test, didn't go quite as well. So, so what you do? So I went to the five departments. I said, What did they say? They each said my part was good. I said, Of course. I'm interested in UCLA, you know, USC, UCLA Business School. They're learning the Western style of management. So, what do you think exactly that we should, like, not put borders on people's jobs? Like, have them all. Realize, realize what you do when you do that. I mean, the first baseman is the first baseman. The first baseman will cover home plate. Okay. So, it's almost more like cross train employees. Well, that's a big part of it. But, um, the question is, who controls the budget? 
Is the budget mine, yours, or ours? That's where it really comes in. And um, I see situations where plant managers were unwilling to spend $100,000 to save the corporation, save $20 million. They were unwilling to make that investment on part of it because they get no benefit. So it's not so much job descriptions. I mean, there's many aspects of this. What you want to be thinking about is how are we constraining team? That's what I want to be thinking about. Yeah, when you put in place employee of the month, does that destroy teamwork or help teamwork? When you put in place preferred parking, does that help? See, if relationships are important, now you start to ask questions about will this help the relationship or hurt the relationship? That's the big question. I, you know, I, I saw that we had you know some of the, the students late, so, so we're in a little bit of a transition. Um, what I suggest is in a moment we're going to take a break. But what I want to do first for my students that are here and also the students online, so the mean attendance quiz, the answer is <laughs> Bill, all lowercase. Okay, oh. Bill, all lowercase. So you have to be at least we like 50 minutes in before you got the answer to the question. <laughs> um, but, but before we sort of transition out, I want, I want to sort of pick up uh, something that the student said about sort of the cross training. If you think about it, you know, we lean people don't always know why we do some of the tools or some of the things that we do. We, you know, and we're always sort of talking about this. We really understand what Toyota was thinking when they put some of these tools and things in place. But listen to Bill, one of the things I realized is when you do the cross training, at least it, t it creates the potential for understanding the gap. Oh, yeah. Right? Because oh, yeah. I understand your job, you understand mine. We now have a little bit better feel for what that gap is, as opposed to if we never did that, you preclude. You know that conversation, or, or you know having that that opportunity to talk about sure. the gap, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, otherwise, it's, it's in, the, in Western management. They have like you can throw the football and never watch it caught, because the only metric is did it meet requirements when it left my hand? So I throw it to Eric. Yeah, and I, well, I throw it. I walk off the field. The coach says, "Where are you going?" I said, "Well, I'm done." Well, you know when you see the ball caught, I say, well, technically, I don't have to watch the ball caught. Technically, if everybody met requirements, the ball would be caught, so don't waste my time. That's my words. I don't have to watch it caught. It's my job is when the ball leaves my hand, it's good. That's all I care about. And the Western management says, as long as it leaves your hands and meets requirements, this is the model of interchangeable parts. They are not interchangeable. They're relatively interchangeable. They're not absolutely interchangeable. So do you feel uh, can, can you hold until after break? Okay. And, and people will be excited because they want to hear what your question is right after break, right? So why don't we do a break until quarter after? Quarter after break, you're allowed to talk to each other if you want.